I'm Lily. Today I'm going to read you the story Charlotte's Web, Chapter Twenty and Chapter Twenty One. First, Chapter Twenty: The Hour of Premium. Special announcement," said the loudspeaker in a pompous voice. "The the management of the fair." Fair takes great pleasure in presenting Mr. Homer L. Jokerman and his famous pig, the drop-bearing case at Tory Diary. Animal is now approaching in Enfield. Kindly stand back and give the truck room to prof- proceed. In a few moments, the pig will be unloaded in the special judging ring in front of the grandstand, where a special award will be made. Will the crowd please make way to let the truck pass? Thank you. Wilbur trembled when he heard the speech. He felt happy but dizzy. Oh, dizzy! I think it sounds. Sorry, but let's see. The truck crept along slowly in a low speed. Crowds of people surrounded it, and Mister Arable had to drive very carefully in order not to run over anybody. At last, he managed to reach the judges' stand. Avery jumped out and lowered to the tailgate. "I'm scared to did that," whispered Missus Chuckerman. "Hundreds of people are looking at us." Cheer up," replied Miss, Mrs. Arable. "This is fun." "Unloading your pig, please," said the loud, loud speaker. "All together, now, boys," said Mr. Jokerman. Several men stepped forward from the crowd to help lift the crate. Avery was the busiest helper of all. "Throw your shirt, shirt, shirt in, Avery!" cried Mrs. Jokerman. "And tighten your belt. Your pants are coming down." Can't you see I'm busy? Replied Avery in disgust. Look, look! Cried Fawn, pointing. That's Harry. Don't shout, Fawn," said her mother, "and don't point." Can I please have some money? Asked Fawn.、Uh, Henry, Henry invited me to go on a Ferris wheel again. Only I don't need. I don't think he has any money left. He ran out of money. Mrs. Durable opened her handbag. Here, she said. Here are his forty cent, forty cents. And now, don't get lost and be back at our regular meeting place by the pig pen very soon. Fawn raced off. Ducking and dodging through the crowd in search of Henry, the Jokerman, the Jokerman pig is now being taken from his crate. Boomed the voice of the loudspeaker. Stand by for an announcement. Temperature crunching under the straw at the bottom of the crate. What a nonsense! What a lot of nonsense! Smiled the rat. What a lot of fuss about nothing. Over in the pig pen, silent and alone, Shelley rested. He, her two two front legs embraced the, the axe. Shelley could hear everything that that was said on the loudspeaker. The words gave her courage. This was her hour of triumph. As Wilbur came out of the crate, the crowd clapped and cheered. Mr. Jokerman took off his cap and bowed. The lurby pulled his back handkerchief. From his pocket and wiped the sweat from the back of his neck. Out of his neck, Avery knelt in the dirt by Wilbur's side, busily struck him, stroking him and showing off. Mrs. Jokerman and Mrs. Arable stood on the runner board of the truck. Let, ladies. Ladies and gentlemen," said the loudspeaker. "We are now present Mr. Homer L. Jokerman's this time distinguished pig. The fame of this unique animal has spread to the four corners of the earth, attracting many valuable towel tourists to our great state. Many of you will recall that never-to-be-forgotten day last summer when the writing appeared mysteriously on the spider's web in Mr. Jokerman's barn, calling the attention of all the sundry to the fact that this pig was completely out of the ordinary. This miracle has been fully explained, although learned men have visited the Jokerman pig, Jokerman pig pen to study on. Observe the phenomenon. In the last 
on our list, we simply know that we are really proud and grateful. In the words of Spider Swap, ladies and gentlemen, this is some pig. Wilbur blushed. He stood perfectly still and tried to look stressed. This is Magnum the animal, continued the loudspeaker. It's true. It's truly terrific. Look at him, ladies and gentlemen. Note the smoothness and whiteness of the coat. Observe the spotless skin, the healthy, healthy, pink glow of ears and snout. It's the buttermilk," whispered Mrs. Terrible to Mrs. Jokerman. Not the general radiance of this animal. Then remember the day when the word radiant appeared clearly on the web. Once. Came whence came this me mysterious writing? Not from the spider. We can rest assured of that. Spiders are clever at weaving their webs, but needless to say, spiders cannot write. Oh, they can't, can't they? Murmured Shirley to him to herself. Ladies and gentlemen, continued the last speaker. I must not take any more of your valuable time. On behalf of the governors of the fair, I have the honor of awarding a special prize of prize of twenty five dollars to Mr. Jokerman, together with a handsome bronze medal, suitable engraved in token of our appreciation of the part played by this pig, this radiant, this terrific, this humble pig in a trap, in a tracking, in a threatening. So many visitors to our great country fair. Wilbur had been feeling dizzier and dizzier through this slow, complimentary speech. When he heard the crowd begin to cheer and clap again, he suddenly fainted away. His legs collapsed, his mind went blank, and he fell to the ground, uncreased. What's wrong? asked the loudspeaker. What's going on, Mr. Jokerman? And Jokerman, what's the trouble with your pig? Avery was kneeling by. Wilbur said, stroking him. Mr. Jokerman was dancing, dancing about, fanning himself with his cap. He's all right, cried Mr. Jokerman. He gets these spells. He's mo modest and can't can't stand praise. Well, we can't give a prize to a dead pig, said the loudspeaker. It it's never been done. He isn't dead, hollered Jokerman. He's fainted. He. He gets embarrassed easily. Run for some water, Lurvy! Lurvy sprang from the judge's ring and disappeared. Templeton poked his head from the straw. He noticed that the end of Wilbur's tail was within reach. Templeton grinned. I will tend to this, he chuckled. He took Wilbur's tail in his mouth and bit it, just as hard as he could bite. The paint would re revive Wilbur. In a flash, he was back on his feet. Ouch! He screamed. Hooray! Yelled the crowd. He's up. The pig's up. Good work, Jokerman. That's some pig. Every everyone was delighted. Mr. Jokerman was the most pleased of all. He sighed with relief. <sighs> Everybody had seen Templeton. Nobody had seen Templeton. The rat had done his work well. Can you see? Avery, Wilbur, and Templeton. Templeton. I don't like Templeton, but today Templeton did a very good job, very good work. Um, and now, one of the judges climbed into the ring with the prizes he'd handed Mr. Jokerman, and with the two. Two ten dollar bills and a five dollar bill. Then he tied a medal around Wilbur's neck. Then he shook hands with Mr. Jokerman while Wilbur blushed. Avery put out his hand and the judge shook hands with him too. The crowd cheered. A photographer took Wilbur's picture. A great feeling of happiness, happiness swept over the Mr. Jokerman's and the Arables. This was the greatest moment in. In Mr. Jokerman's life, he is deeply satisfied to win a prize in front of a lot of people. As Wilbur was being shoved back into the crate, Lurvy came charging through the crowd, carrying a pail of water. His eyes had a wild look. Without, without hesitating a second, he he dashed the water at Wilbur. 
in his excitement, he missed his aim, and the water splashed all about Mr. Jokerman and Avery. They got soaking wet. For goodness sake, bellowed Mr. Jokerman, who was really drenched. What else, you lurvy? Can't you see the piggies all right? You ask for water, said the lurvy meekly. I didn't ask for a shower bath, said Mr. Jokerman. The crowd rolled with laughter. Finally, Mr. Jokerman had to laugh too. And of course, Avery was tickled to himself to wet. And he, and he immediately started to act like a clown. He pretended he was taking a shower bath. He made faces and danced around and rubbed immediately. Imaginarily soap under his armpits. Then he dried himself with an imaginary tower. Avery, stop up! Stop it! cried his mother. Stop shying off! But the crowd loved it. Avery heard nothing but the Apollos. He liked being a clown in a ring with Avery, everybody watching. In front of a grandstand, when he discovered there, there was a, a there was still a leaf, little water in left in the bottom of the pear, pail. He raised the pail high in the air and drum, dumped the water on himself, on himself and made faces. The children in the grandstand screamed with oppression. At last, things come down. Wilbur was loaded into the truck. Avery was led from the ring by his mother and placed on the seat of the truck to dry off. The truck, driven by Mr. Arable, crawled slowly back to his pipen. Avery's wet trousers made a big wet spot on the seat. Now, Chapter 21, Last Day. Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for farm. Temperton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of care money. His medal still hung from his neck. By looking out the corner of his eye, he could see it. Charlotte, said Wilbur after a while, why are you so quiet? I like you still quiet, she said. I've always been rather quiet, but you seem specially so today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I felt peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. You will live secure and safe, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you now. These autumn days will shorten and go cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come, then the snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world. For you mean a great deal to Jokerman, and he will not harm you ever. Winter will pass, the days will lengthen, the ice will melt in the pasture pond, the song sparrow will return and sing, the frogs will walk awake, the warm wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be yours to enjoy Wilbur. This lovely world, these precious days, shall stop. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's side. Oh, Charlotte, he said, to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. When he recovered from his emotion, he spoke again. Why did you do all this for me? he asked. I don't deserve it. I never done. I never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. That it itself is a tremendous thing. I wore my wraps for you because I like you. After all, what what's a life? Anyway, we are born. We we live a little while. We die. Sp a spider's life can't help being something of a mess. With all this trapping and eating flies, by helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone. Anyone's life can stand a little of that. Well, said Bob, I'm no good at making as making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words, but you say you have saved me, Charlotte, and I would gladly give my life for you. I really would. I'm sure you would. And I thank you you for your generosity.
generous sentiments. Sentiments. She loved said Wilbur. We are going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be beautiful to back home in the bird cellar again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Sheila said nothing. Then she spoke in a low, so low, in a, in a voice so low, Wilbur could hardly hear the words. I will not be going back to the barn, she said. Wilbur looked his bed. Not going back? He cried. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm done for, she replied. In a day or two, I will be dead. I haven't even strength enough to climb down into the creek. I doubt if I have enough silk in my spin spinnerets to lower me to the ground. Hear di hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in an agony of pear and sorrow. Gray sobs wrapped his body. He half and grunted with desolation. Charlotte, he moaned, he moaned, Charlotte, my true friend, come now, let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, Wilbur, stop thrashing about. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I want to leave you here alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall stay too. Don't be ridiculous, said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Jokerman and Lurby and John Arable and the others will be back any minute. Now. Now. And they they will shove you into the crate. And, oh, and away you will go. Besides, it won't make any sense for you to stay. There would be no one to feed you. The fairgrounds will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was in a panic. He reset around and looked to looked up. Suddenly he had an idea. He thought of the accent and the five hundred and fourteen little spiders to the wood that would hatch in the spring. If Charlotte Joseph was unable to go home to the barn, the least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of his pen. He put his front foot on the board and gazed around in the den the distance he saw the rebels and the jokomas approaching. He knew he would have to act quickly. Where is Templeton? he demanded. He's he is in the corner, under the straw asleep, says Charlotte. Wilbur watched the bird, pushing his strong snout under the rat, and tossed him into the air. Templeton screamed Wilbur, pay attention. The rat, surprised out of a sound sleep, looked first dazed and disgusted. What kind of moonshine is this? He called. Can't a rat, can't a, can't a rat catch a wink of sleep without being rudely popped into the air? Listen to me, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. He has only a short time to leave. He, she can't upon us home because her, because of her condition. Therefore, if it is absolutely necessary that I take her accent with me, I can't reach it. I and I can't climb. Cly, you're the only one that can get it. There's not a second to be lost. The people are coming. They will they will be here in no time. Please, 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 Templeton, climb up and get the exit. The red young. Um, the sh he straightened his whiskers. Then he looked up at the exit. So, he said in disgust. So it's for Templeton to rescue again. Is it, is it? Templeton, do this. Templeton, do that. Templeton, please run down to the jump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please slant me a piece of a string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry, said Wilbur. Hurry up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. He began to murmur. Wilbur's voice. So, it's hurry up, Templeton, is it? He said. Ha ha. What? And what thanks do I ever get for these services? I would like to know. Never a kind word for old Templeton, only a buzz and whiskers and side remarks. Never a kind word for rat. Templeton, said Wilbur in disperation. If you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost and will and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up. Templeton lay back in the stroll. Hazily he placed his for Paris behind his head closed his knees in audition. Die of a broken heart, he meekled. 
how touching. My, my. I noticed that it's always me you come to when in trouble. But I never heard of anyone's heart breaking on my account. Oh no, who cares anything about Earth kind of Templeton? Get up, scrambled over. Stop acting like a sport child. Templeton Greg now lay still. Who made trip after trip to the dump? He asked. Why it was or Templeton who saved Charlotte's life by scaring that arable boy away with a rotting goose egg? Bless my soul, I believe it was or Templeton who bit your tail and got you back on your feet this morning after you had fainted in front of the car. Or Templeton, has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? Why do you think? I am, oh, anyway, a rat of all work. Where was this bird? The people were coming, and the rat was failing. Suddenly, he remembered Templeton's fondness for food. Templeton, he said, I will make you a solemn promise. Get your looks set for me, and from now on, I will let you eat first. When Lervis loves me, I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough, and I won't touch a thing until your trough. The rat said, oh, You mean that? He said, I promise, I cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. He walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself slowly to the ceiling. He crept along till he reached the exit. Shallow moved aside for him. She was dying, but she still had strength enough to move a little. When Templeton bared his long, ugly teeth and began snipping the threads that fastened the sack to the ceiling, Wilbur watched from below. You deserve care, he said. I don't want a single one of those eggs harmed. This stuff thicks in my mouth, complained the rat. It's worse than caramel candy. But Templeton worked away at the job at, and managed to cut the, cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground, where he dropped it in front of Wilbur. Wilbur heaved a great sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton, he said. I will never forget this. As long as I live, I live. Neither will I, said the rat, picking his teeth. I feel as I'd eaten a spool of thread. Well, home we go. Templeton crept into the crate and buried himself into the stall. He got over his sight just in time. Lurby and John Arable and Mr. Dockerman came along at the moment, followed by Mrs. Terrible and Mrs. Dockerman, and Avery and Fern. Wilbur had already decided that... decided... Wilbur had already decided how he, w he would carry the accent. There was only one way possible. He carefully took the little bundy in his mouth and held it there on top of his tongue. He remembered that Charlotte had told him that the sack was waterproof and strong. He felt it felt sunny, funny on his tongue and made him make him draw a bit. And of course he couldn't say anything, but as he was being shoved into the crate, he looked up at Charlotte and gave a wink. She knew she knew he was saying goodbye in an only way he could. And she knew her children were safe. Goodbye, she whispered, then she summoned all her strength and waved off her front legs at him. She never moved again. The next day, his Ferris wheel was taken apart, the race horses and the lane were in the vans, and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers. Shallow died. The fairgrounds were soon deserted. The sheriff's or buildings were empty and fallen. The info the infield was littered with bottles and trash. Nobody of the hundreds of people that had invited the fair knew that a gray spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. Bye tomorrow I'm going to read the last chapter, A War Wind. Bye.